Well, I have the honor and the privilege of being the last speaker, which means I get to ask for a round of applause for all the amazing talks that we've heard that have preceded me. So let's hear it for everybody who's come before me who's shared with us today. My hope today is to share with you a framework that will potentially be helpful in processing some of the amazing best practices and stories that you've heard from other presenters. The title of my um, time with you here today is Moving the Development Needle. It could have easily been Moving the Mobilization Needle or Moving the Accompaniment Needle or the partnership needle, or the impact needle, or even the blessing needle. That's a little precursor of things that you're gonna hear over the next 20 minutes, which I marked here because I have a tendency to like to tell stories and go long, so I'm gonna try to restrain myself. And also, for those who know me, they know I love to pray, and for those who know me well, this is the shortest prayer you'll ever hear me give. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So let's get started. I decided to go with old school flip charts because I wanted it to be interactive. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And if you don't, feel free to let me know. If you do, feel free to let me know. So there is a, this is Casey's paraphrase of Genesis 12:2. And we are any blessed, you got it, to be a blessing. Exactly, thank you. And you can also, um, in your copious free time, look at that as a paraphrase of lots of other scriptures throughout the biblical narrative. Philippians 2.4, Luke 6.31, 2 Corinthians 9.11, even Romans 8.28. Now, I wanna give you an African Proverbs take on that same scripture. And let's see if you can guess. Don't steal my... Some of you that know me have heard me say this and have even heard the story that I'm about to share about this. But don't steal my blessing. I cannot tell you how many times I had to hear that before I internalized it as we partner with folks across Africa. But I know the first time that I ever heard that was when there was a gentleman that was approximately twice my age that met me at the airport with several other folks in Malawi. And I tend to pack so that I can very easily self-manage all of my luggage. And so I came out with my roller bag and my backpack and very little else. And he wanted to help me. And I said, no, no, I've got it. And I saw his countenance change. But I didn't really recognize why that might be. And I thought, how disrespectful of me to allow someone who's at least 80, to carry my bag. So I took my roller bag to the van and we got in the van and drove to our um, ultimate destination for the day and I got out and he asked me again, can I carry your bag? And I said, no, 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 I, I've, I've got it. I don't wanna trouble you. And I saw his countenance change. And then the third time that day, as we finally moved into our rooms, he asked me a third time, and this time was a little bit more forceful and kind of pushed my hand away from my own roller bag, which, you know, being the type A kind of person that I am, um, that, that was interesting. But I let him this time and his countenance just beamed and he was so thrilled to be able to do that. And so later that night I asked someone, what, what was that all about? And they told me the first two times you stole his blessing. The last, the third time you allowed him to bless you. As we think about the fact that we are blessed to be a blessing, what does it mean to allow our partners, those we come alongside, serve alongside and are present with to be blessed to be a blessing to us?
There may be um, the ability to pull this up on the screen. If not, don't worry about it. Um, if you go to SOE.org, that stands for Standards of Excellence. There are seven standards of excellence in short-term missions. There it is. And we're going to have this as a handout before we have our Q&A so that you can all see it. In my talk today, I'm going to focus on two of those standards of excellence. They are empowering partnerships and mutual design. But I want to briefly let you know what the other ones are. The first one is God-centeredness. The fourth one is comprehensive administration. The fifth is qualified leadership. The sixth is appropriate training. And the seventh is thorough follow-through. But under empowering partnerships and mutual design, here are some of the phrases that you would see. Healthy, interdependent, ongoing relationships expressed by a focus on our partners, plans that benefit all, and mutual trust and accountability. And then under mutual design, you'll hear phrases like collaboratively plans each outreach for the benefit of all through methods and activities aligned for long-term strategies of the partnership. And so with that in mind, what does all of that that you just heard look like in practice? Well, if there was a simple answer, as one of our presenters said yesterday, if there was a simple answer, then everyone would be doing this perfectly already. But in practice, it's a journey, not an easy journey, not a short journey, and it's a process. So, with that in mind, where do we begin? Well, I would suggest, as Tom alluded to earlier today, that we begin with asset mapping. And really, asset mapping can be boiled down to two, two main questions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you see why one's a little better than another. But one of the questions is, what do you need? The you in that sentence being our partners. And the other question is, what do you have? So I want to ask you all, for us, which question typically comes first? What do you need or what do you have? What do you need? That's almost always what we ask first. And imagine if that's the first question we ask, what position does that put our partners in immediately? It's kind of like, what do you need as we look down upon you? Not a position that I think any of us would relish being in particularly, and I would make the case neither do our partners. What's critical about both of these questions is to turn it around on ourselves and ask, what do I need versus what do I have? And imagine if we force ourselves also to not ask what do we need or NEEP, it looks like there, what do, we, what do I need, but instead to ask what do I have as we're asking our partners the same questions. And at our church, one of the things that we have forced ourselves to wrestle with over the years is that every project, program, or initiative must be, hear that, must be an answer to a question that the partner is asking. So our, our, the, previ the presenter immediately preceding me talked about their initiative to bring shoes and how really that kind of began with them, resonated with them. And imagine 
as resurrection has paid that same dumb tax um, more than once, um, imagine the reality that would have been had they started with the confirmation that they were answering a question that their partner was asking. And as we talk about these mapping tools throughout our time today, at the, at the bottom of each of those, I'm putting the comment around goal setting. Who does the goal setting? Who drives the goal setting? And so specifically here, our partner drives the goal setting. That doesn't mean that we certainly don't have input, um, that we don't look at intersections between our uh, gifts, graces, abilities, passions, but as you see my steering wheel there that looks kind of like Darth Vader's vehicle in Star Wars, um, our goal setting driver is our partner as we look at assets that they bring to the table. Um, Actually, before I turn that page, I want to share with you a quick story, or maybe a not-so-quick story, of me, my backpack, and a question. About two and a half years into our partnership with Malawi, I decided that I wanted to attempt something different. And so I took the opportunity to have a day and a half where the team that I was with didn't particularly need me, and I went into a neighboring community, and I asked our, our driver and our partner to park far enough away that the community wouldn't see the vehicle that we were driving in on. This community was pretty far off the grid, um, a road that is relatively difficult to traverse, even impassable during the rainy season, if that gives you an idea. No electricity of any kind, no running water of any kind. And so me and my backpack walked into the village with my um, friend and translator. And the question that I posed to the chief was, can I be your student? Can I be your student for a day, maybe two? depending on how long they wanted to tolerate this visitor. And over the course of that day, in the, in the pouring rain, we walked and did asset mapping of this community. We saw every water source, every leader's home, um, where the church was, where the initiation for young men happened, where um, women gathered to sow. Every asset as defined by our partners, we saw, and there was a gentleman that walked along with us and literally drew it on a map. They had never done that before. They were so pumped. It was great. They made up songs about it. It was a blast. The fascinating piece of that was when it was finished, they said, we, we want to keep this map ourselves so that we can remind each other of all that we have here, all that we're blessed with. And in my head, I said, to be a blessing to others like me. It would have been interesting had I made that decision to do that five years ago when we started our partnership with Malawi, but... That wasn't the case. However, I will say that as we did embark upon our partnership in Malawi, we did do a site visit that was about asset mapping. And our only uh, parting communication was, we will respond to you after you've had an opportunity to process our visit, to make some decisions on whether or not we're the kind of partner you would want and after you've had an opportunity to prioritize the assets that you have and the needs that you have, which took them a while, but they did before we ever got started. I wanted to share now one of these, um, 
one of these um, miles per hour graphs, if you can't tell what it is. What this is supposed to be is a needle, and the red line in this case is actually where you want to be. So in this, in this um, diagram, I wanna show you what we have. The dollar sign represents money, I know you're surprised. These are people, if you can't tell. And this is transformational strategies. So I'm gonna write those up here. Money, people, and transformational strategies. You see why I wrote things in advance because my writing is better in advance transformational strategies. Now, what you may not be able to see is that these transformational strategies are around things like food security, these are crops, housing security, that's not a ladder, it's actually a fence, which represents security in general. This is a hospital bed representing health. This is a lady that's well-dressed and has a great job and this is a child who is pumping water from a well. So our asset mapping leads us into considering what are the inputs that we have at our disposal as a potential partner. Some of us um, may really focus initially on, on money and receiving proposals from our partners and really that being the, the crux of the relationship. While that could be a place to begin, it certainly isn't what I were, where I would advocate that you begin. Some of us might begin with people and what it means for our folks to engage and be blessed as, the part, as part of a partnership. And that, is, that isn't a bad place to start. But I would tell you that as this needle, as we try to move this needle toward transformational strategies, that actually that's a great place to start. In looking at this part of the diagram, these are short-term focus. And I'm asking that we all consider long-term intentionality. and what that means. The reason why I put this, why I begin with this graph around inputs is that we all have some variation of these and depending on the patience and the focus and the willingness that we are able to give to a process that can be long, we can enter into a partnership with transformational strategies. That is a learning on the part of Church of the Resurrection and on my part. I would not say that that is something that we do perfectly by any stretch, but it is something that we've learned is really important. And as we have needed, we back up and do that and reassess. As you look at those inputs, I wanted to just give you a little framework for how that might work. Probably most of you have heard of SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And as you look at input mapping, what would it mean if we looked internally, that's what this graphic swirl is supposed to mean, if we look internally at our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and we also look externally at our partners and their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, but then what if we ask them to do the same thing? before we ever get started together, before we ever lay down how we're gonna allocate resources or anything along those lines, what if we ask them to internally look at those, at their own SWOT analysis and to look at us? What would that look like if our partners, before we ever decided on any resource allocation, if they did a SWOT analysis of us? Some questions that Factor into input mapping. I mean, really easy questions like, who are we? I mean, we all know that, right? Yeah. Um, who are we separately? 
Who are we together? What do we do well? What do we truly care about? Or another way to think about is what are our priorities? And then what are we willing to sacrifice? I wanna answer a couple of those for us. Um, one of the things that we do is we ask for the vision or purpose statement of our partners. And if they don't have one, we, uh, we kinda try to ease them in that direction. Who we are at Resurrection is we are a church focused on building a Christian community where non-religious and nominally religious people are becoming deeply committed Christians. And we have looked at that in terms of our partnerships as critical to our partnerships. And one other question that I want to focus on is what are we willing to sacrifice? I've heard on more than one occasion what it means to volunteer in cultures where there is so much hardship, so many obstacles, and in lots of ways, um, so few what we would traditionally call resources. And that mindset sometimes permeates discussions that we would have with our partners. But the reality is on both sides, we've got to understand what we're willing to sacrifice. And for our partners, that might be time and energy. For us, it might be time, energy, and resources. But there has to be an understanding as you look at the inputs into the partnership, what is each side willing to sacrifice? And the journey of processing these questions helps determine transformational strategies for mobilization. The mobilization of our people in such a way that we embark upon the process of journey effectively. So with that in mind, I want to also remind us who drives that process. As I contemplated that, I, I actually started with, we drive it. But I came to the conclusion that really, each drives their own input mapping process. So with that in mind, let's move from inputs to outcomes. Using the same chart of money, people, and all of the things that I mentioned in that circle, money takes on a different, a different word here that, I'm gonna, that you've heard a couple of times as we've talked, and that is relief. One of the outcomes is providing food, um, clothes, things that are potentially needed but are very temporary, um, short-term ways of aid. Then we look at engaging people and what that means, and we can refer to that as betterment. Betterment would include training and empowerment and scholarships for folks to go to school. Um, all sorts of things fall under the category of betterment. And then finally, over here, is community development. So these are the outcomes that we're looking for in moving from a short-term focus to again, long-term intentionality. So what does that look like, practically speaking? Well, it looks, it looks like a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that, that I wanna move us directly into is how do we map outcomes? If we were going to look at mapping what we're, what we're talking about in outcomes from relief betterment to community development, what does that look like? So one way that you can think about it is really a continuum of transformation where most likely, all of us are gonna be engaged in some level of relief, um, maybe continually. Uh, we're, 
you know, we're going to be engaged in some level of betterment, maybe continually, but moving toward community development and then at times focusing back on relief and betterment. And we have a goal that we would at least function at a third, a third, a third, as we look at resources, partnerships, working together. And a visual way, as you can see my um, amazing hand artistry there, a visual way to engage in this is, this is a handout. This, so relief and aid is a handout. Betterment is a hand up. And community development is really a hand off where we provide peer to peer accompaniment and assistance, and then we work ourselves out of a job and get out of the way. So, relief again is about short, ter short term aid, and you might just call it help. Betterment is about medium-term equipping, or you might say, training. And then community development is about long-term empowerment. And as I was preparing last night, it was fascinating to me that this word empowerment that gets defined in so many different ways, it just dawned on me that if you think about the root of empowerment, what it means is that we're giving up power to our partners. We are giving over power to our partners so that they might rise above any expectations or goals that we might have, but instead live into their own goals, dreams, and expectations. And who drives this process of outcome mapping, both do, mutually. So I want to move from outcome mapping to impacts. I'm going to go to this side. As you look at impacts, it is using the same diagram in just a different way we have two choices here, dependency, and it's never quite this simple, but for today, let it be. Dependency or long-term, I'm gonna write with my left hand here, that's dangerous, long-term sustainability. You have to pretend like that says long term. And so, what does that, what does that mean in reality? As we look again at short term focus, long term intentionality, the word here, by the way, is accompaniment, which we can talk about a little bit more in the Q&A. And then, the word here, is our journey and process of partnership. That truly, until you have gone through the process of looking at inputs and outcomes, input mapping, outcome mapping, strategic planning that goes along with those, it's only once you begin to focus on what you want your impacts to be that you should really consider that a partnership. And you see arrows over there that start with the asset mapping and an arrow here that ends with monitor and evaluation and assessment. We can talk more about that in our Q&A time, but I just wanted to help us all see that it's a circle. It's a circle of assessment that doesn't end once you've made the decision to partner. So how do we, how do we map impacts? What kind of questions do we ask as we map impacts? Well, I tried to draw this so that it would look like a partnership roadmap. And the roadmap has multiple pieces that are important. 
First and foremost, we've learned, and I can tell you multiple stories about this, is that you've got to assess leadership. It is critical that, you, that the leadership on the ground, that you understand it and that, it is, that you're comfortable with it and that everybody is on the same page in terms of the leadership. You also need to look at the planning capabilities of not only yourselves, but your partners. Um, you need to look at the implementation capacity of your partners because that leads to local resource utilization. So local resources. And then finally, a willingness to do whatever it takes. So notice where we typically start is here. And I'm saying that before you ever talk about resources, doing whatever it takes to understand where's the leadership, where's the planning capacity, where's the implementation capabilities, and then clearly understanding what is the willingness of both sides to do whatever it takes. So as you look about, as you look at this um, continuum from dependence to sustainability, there are a couple of, a couple or six things that I think are important, again, to acknowledge that the better the leader on the ground, the more impact. Impact is going to be the word in all of these. The better the team, the more cohesive, the more... Um, Cohe cohesive and uh, cooperative and collaborative the team, the better the impact. The better the training, training that folks may have already had, training that you might mutually decide that you need together, the better the impact. The more planning, just to reiterate planning that happens, the better the impact. And finally moving up again to local resources, the more the focus is on local resources and their availability, and then finally, sacrifice. Short-term sacrifice for long-term impact. It's critical that everybody understands that this isn't gonna be a stained glass window, that it's not going to be some happy, happy, joy, joy, moment after moment all the time. That this road from dependence to sustainability is phenomenally difficult or we wouldn't be having this conversation today. People wouldn't be talking about this in pretty much every circle. There wouldn't be books written about dead aid. There wouldn't be people in videos that say, the path that we've chosen to pursue in aid has never resulted in a quote unquote third world country becoming a first world country. And the quicker that we recognize that that pathway leads to nowhere, that the way we've done things in the past leads to nowhere, and the, and the reality that this process is incredibly difficult and time consuming, and that we've gotta be committed for the long haul, the better off we'll be. So what is the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is sustainable transformation. The ultimate goal is not being a donor, but instead being an impact partner. And the mutuality that comes from that is amazing and critical. With that, I want to close out our time by showing you a covenant that it's called the 50-50 Covenant, and I'm gonna read a couple phrases from it, and then I'll let that be our transition into our Q&A time. I want you to see, hear some of the phrases that are outlined in this covenant that's based on 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. Some of the phrases are, to develop a healthy relationship, transformative and inspirational. To develop a collaborative partnership that's honest 
with open interaction, to be equally participative, proportionally 50-50, to set aside our own agendas for a collective vision, to be listeners and learners so that local people are empowered. This covenant reminds us that we pledge, we covenant together not to do for the other what they can do for themselves, and that's both ways that we create mutual accountability and transparency through patiently engaging one another. And then finally, and let this sink in, and this will be my last comment, the donors are working themselves out of a job, seeking neither credit nor control, and all partners are sharing in the blessing of a job well done together. Let's not steal their blessing in Jesus' name. Thank you.